Hello again. Uh, crypto firepower, I like the sound of that. Um, I want to start this panel doing something a bit different. I've got a really interesting question, and I want you all to vote. And this isn't one of these like, dumb votes. This is a good one. Um, Barry uh, Silbert, you're running national TV commercials advising people to drop gold and buy Bitcoin, right? Correct. OK. Uh, you know, a lot of you are probably rich enough to do that. Not everyone is. And I think it's a really interesting dilemma. Suppose you have a young child like me, or just someone you care about, and you can give them $10,000 worth of gold or Bitcoin, and that's all they get. Um, which would you pick? So can I please see a show of hands for gold? Put them right up, everyone. Bitcoin. Wow. Wow. Wow, I'd call that 50-50. Yeah. Maybe 60-40. <laughs> all right. <And> all right. <laughs> Let's so, there's, so there's 8 trillion of gold out there and uh, about 150 billion of Bitcoin. So if we end up at 50-50, that's a, that's a win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's jump into it. Uh, Facebook, Libra, we've had people on stage can't comment. I'm sure you guys have some opinions. Let's, let's go into it. Um, is it going to work? Uh, Jeremy, you want to start? Sure. Uh, you know, I think um, you have to kind of break it down into a couple pieces. So one is, you know, as a kind of third generation blockchain, how does it compare to other third generation blockchains like the next versions of Ethereum or new platforms like Cosmos or Algorand? There's a lot of comp competition in that space. I think um, broadly, uh, the crypto ecosystem is interested in, in permissionless platforms that allow anyone in the world to participate, any developer to participate, to build things. Um, and so there's a real question, I think, of whether a, a, a model like this uh, can really encourage that level of uh, of open collaboration. So I think that's one, one question. And I think the, um, the, the overview that has been published by the Libra Association is aspirational with respect to that. But it's also very clear uh, that this is going to be you know, pretty tightly managed, pretty tightly controlled, pretty tightly scoped. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I'm not convinced in the short term that that's going to be attractive to developers. Amber, do you agree? Um, I think in order to figure out if it is going to be successful, we would really need to understand what the ultimate goal was. And it's not entirely clear to me whether they're attempting to compete in the cashless payment space or in the public cryptocurrency space, which are really two very different things. Um, I think something that is relatively assured, if we look at the, uh, their other pushes to provide, say, subsidized internet access in emerging economies, that if you were to tie that to something like a payment rail, that you get all that kind of primary payments data married to a social graph, uh, that's very powerful. And so we shouldn't forget about the underlying data play there. Uh, so if it launches, <laughs> which is a, a, a big question right now, uh, I believe it'll go down in history as being the catalyst that brings digital assets to the global mass consumer audience. And I'm not suggesting that Libra itself is going to be a, a good investment, good token, is going to be the winner. Um, but I think about the impact that Netscape had um, on internet awareness and adoption. And I, and I, and I, I believe that, that is, that's what we're going to be looking at. It'll be a year, 18 months from now. Because if you think about the education and the accessibility that this is going to um, uh, be a catalyst for, and, 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 and also, ultimately, anybody who has a Libra wallet, it's going to be a digital asset wallet. And so they're going to have 2,000 other digital assets they're going to be able to participate right. I, in. Just to add to that, I mean, this is, I, I view likewise, this is a massive inflection point. We've gone from a, a world where, you know, if you're a policymaker or you're in a major financial institution, you can be dismissive about cryptocurrency. You can say, oh, I don't know, this is like a bunch of people doing drugs or whatever, however you rationalize your thinking on it. Um, but the reality is it's like this is, you know, the, the next major infrastructure layer of the internet. And if you actually study it closely and you understand what blockchains are, they're like the fundamental new architecture for how data, identity, financial transactions, lots of things are going to happen. You're going to reconstruct the way services work on the internet, on blockchains, on public blockchains. And so um, I think that's been, you know, people have missed that. It's also an inflection point from a policy perspective because, um, you know, this concept of um, reserve currencies uh, executed as stable coins over these networks, um, that's something that lots of people have been working on, including ourselves. That's now front and center. Um, billions of people are going to be able to transmit value with each other instantly at no cost. 
They're going to be able to move value uh, between economies, between individuals and businesses frictionlessly. And that, I think there's been a lot of collective denial about whether that would happen. And it's very clear that is happening. And uh, governments uh, and others have to respond to it. OK, if this is such a good idea, why didn't Apple or Amazon do it? They almost have better infrastructure than Facebook. They don't have the same social layer, but they have more trust. And they're also perhaps better poised to be kind of at a banking layer. So, so do you think they will? Oh, well, look, they... Look, Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, they're, they're all going to respond somehow, some way. And, and so are the banks. The banks, if, you, if Libra is successful, it is going to uh, disintermediate the banks in a number of areas where the banks participate. And so the banks are going to have to figure out, OK, how are they going to play a role in the, the digitization of, of money uh, and this new infrastructure layer? And those companies don't have billions of users that are interacting with each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis every day on a massive scale. Um, and obviously, if you look at what Tencent has done in China, uh, with you know, 700 million, 800 million people, they've revolutionized the way the you know, economic interaction happens. You can imagine what that looks like on a global scale. Um, I think the other, though, is a deeper issue, and this gets to Zuck's recent speech um, about privacy, which is you know, this, this issue with centralization on the internet that internet companies, certain internet companies are perceived to have too much power that they, have, they aggregate too much uh, customer data, and there's this m desire to shift more to a decentralized architecture. And I actually think this is a little bit like Bill Gates in 1995 saying, we're going all in on the open internet and uh, you know, betting on the open roads, if you remember the essay from Bill Gates. And I think that um, this is a little bit of Zuck doing the same thing, saying we're betting on decentralization. If you read the Libra paper closely, you'll see it's aspirational to build identity protocol layers for self-sovereign identity, uh, for the ability for individuals control, to control their own data. Um, and you can imagine how that could interact with messaging platforms, financial platforms, other things. It's much more aspirational, I think. Um, payments is an initial use case, but um, the, the, a much more decentralized, private way to exchange information is ultimately, I think, the end goal. Yeah. yeah, I think that you know it, it's important to remember that Tencent is essentially the linchpin in an authoritarian government's execution scheme. And when we look at uh, centralized, centralized platforms uh, that have data coming into a single place, that that is not the place where your decentralized identity comes from. It's where your ongoing Facebook login comes from. And if you skim through the white paper, I, I thought that privacy was not potentially adequately addressed, although there is a fantastic team of cryptographers that Facebook has brought in over the last couple months. And so if we look at um, how they've treated privacy in the past and how they acquired WhatsApp um, and how WhatsApp is in the position of needing to monetize an end-to-end -end encrypted platform and has struggled to do so, but we need to unite these platforms across Instagram and Facebook and WhatsApp, it is an opportunity to really do something with quote-unquote on-chain privacy, but they haven't yet um, said that they will or made any strides in that direction. And so I don't think that it's fair to necessarily, or not fair, but it's not a foregone conclusion that um, the technology at the end needs to look like one thing or the other. But in one case, we end up with a very centralized thing that is widely distributed and available. And the other, we end up with kind of a, a William Gibsonian kind of corporate dystopia. And in neither of those do regular people have much agency in their financial lives. Yeah, I love the idea of Facebook bequeathing us a decentralized login tool where we could log onto the net anonymously, the dream of decentralization. But I mean, this is a company that's made its billions, you know, mining our social relationships. I mean, do you think they are actually going to do it? I would love to see them embrace privacy more. And you know, a lot of uh, folks are very interested in, in speaking with them and working with them and, and making that happen. The door is always open for those conversations. Interesting anecdote backstage, Jeremy mentioned that there's a whole cohort of privacy-focused tokens, digital currencies out there. And after this news came out, over the past 48 hours, they're all up massively. We've been, we've been buying a number of the ones that we like, because I think it's just bringing to the forefront. Can you give some examples for people aren't familiar with what a privacy coin is? Yeah, so um, there are a number of different ways that these protocols are designed. Uh, Bitcoin is highly traceable. You can follow the money as it moves around the system, which is why criminals don't use it to do bad things. But since Bitcoin came out, there's half a dozen other protocols that came out that make it um, more difficult or impossible to, to follow the, the transactions. So what did you buy? Well, we're, we're big believers in something called Zcash, um, which was probably the first, one of the first privacy coins that came out, and then a, a version of Zcash called Horizon, uh, which came out about a year or so ago. 
Amber, I want to go back to something that uh, Barry said about banks being disrupted. I'm a little skeptical. I mean, banks have been around a long time, and also, I'm not going to put my savings into Libra. You worked at a big bank. What's going through their minds right now? You're, Amber was at JP Morgan for a long time. Banks yeah, do There's tell. other people yeah. in the room you can ask those questions too. But, but they won't um, answer it. But you, <laughs> now you can actually say what's on your mind. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've had the media training. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, banks provide lots of useful services. And, um, you know, I, Perhaps it would be a sad state of affairs to be in where we need banks to provide an, a, a degree of decentralization from an integrated corporate, compute, storage, social, and everything else system. So um, there's a reason that you know, there are becoming reasons why decentralization or separation of powers becomes important to maintaining robust markets and antitrust situations. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you to I guess go back to the Facebook point, if you look at kind of who was participating uh, in that um, in the initial node hosting, you know, there weren't any banks there, and a lot of people noticed that, right? So looking at the incentives and how the markets are um, going to evolve, it really it's about providing businesses at a profit to a consumer base. Uh, what consumers ultimately right now, what they get is privacy in the middle for that. You, you trust who you work with. Uh, and so until you can unbundle um, not just privacy, but uh, credit markets, decentralized finance, and everything else, I, I don't think that we're at any risk of the, the larger scale banking system going anywhere. So I'm not totally sold on that. I mean, I think we can all look at China is an example where you know the dominant retail financial companies are internet companies, and they've been they've rapidly risen, and uh, they provide the payment accounts, the savings accounts, the investment vehicles. Um, it's it's been dramatic, um, and and that's you know that's significant. I think we've had people on stage today that are technology companies that are taking rapidly growing uh, a share of of offering of credit or offering of savings and. So uh, it's not it's not totally clear uh, there, but I think you know back to the on the crypto topic. I mean, I think um, this this concept that um, you know uh, reserve currencies are going to be issued as digital currency, uh, and that you're going to be able to build financial products on top of those tokenized uh, reserve currency assets. It's an extremely powerful concept, and it allows you to begin to unbundle what banks do, and allows you to render those services in ways that anyone with a mobile device anywhere in the world can access. Um, and that is a, essentially a shift into a kind of software-based, open internet-based model for how financial products can be rendered. I mean, that's the whole re sort of reason why Circle exists, is to build those kinds of products. I think we're now hitting an inflection point where at a, both a technology and a regulatory, uh, from a technology and regulatory perspective, that you can actually start to really build those things. And it's not uh, without reason to imagine that there are going to be large-scale not just fintechs, but internet companies that are delivering financial products and services to hundreds of millions or billions of people. And that will be a over the top move, over the top of the internet in the same way that Netflix went over the top and even Facebook went over the top to bypass what communications companies did. And so I, I see the next uh, five years as pretty dramatic in terms of an, the ultimate impact uh, to banks. Yep, and let me just say, I, I wanna say that I agree with this in that what, what I meant is, um, Unbundling the banks does, should not necessarily mean a rebundling into incumbent technology companies. We'd love to unbundle some of these services and have them create a robust, more open access system, um, but it's very hard to keep those things out there. I mean, that's why I'm working on decentralized infrastructure solutions as well, is hopefully that's where these things run. So, absolutely. I mean, I mean just devil's advocate, are these things getting any traction? I like the idea of decentralized applications. That's where you do things like you know, banking or word processing on a global network of decentralized computers. No one knows who you are. Are, sounds great, but the reality is these things, they're called dApps, have like just hundreds, you know, not even thousands of users, and we've been at it for a couple of years. I mean, you know, it's, do you think the dream is too ambitious? Or? I think it would be cool if people had blogs again. <laughs> Remember, do you, did anybody ever host their own blog? Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, it was kind of hard, right? That's why everything's on Medium now. And that's the kind of centralization that leads to deplatforming and everything else that um, when we talk about decentralized infrastructure, we're not necessarily just talking about blockchains. We're talking about access to open internet infrastructure, just like he said. So it doesn't have to be dApps with millions of users and tokens and all this other stuff. There's a lot that we could change for people, especially new people coming online, that have an increasingly limited choice of solutions. I, I, I think you know, when, you, when you look at the evolution of, of crypto and blockchains in particular, 
they're sort of first generation blockchains and second generation blockchains. I'd say Ethereum squ squarely fits in the second generation blockchain category. And it sort of aspirationally allowed people to build things like decentralized applications, but the architecture itself was not really capable of scaling beyond sort of tens of millions of people who'd interact with that platform. So everybody's been focused on, okay, what, how do you build a third generation blockchain? Libra's a take on that. Um, Ethereum 2 is a very significant uh, take on that that has a massive amount of developer activity around it. Just today, a major breakthrough blockchain launch, Algorand, um, which is a third generation blockchain that is fully decentralized in terms of who can participate and execute on it. And it, it's designed to scale to support you know, hundreds of millions or, or even billions of users over time. And so we're, it's sort of like in the pre-broadband era of the internet, you know, everyone was so excited about the web and all these companies got started. And then when you actually went to use the web and you use these services, it really sucked. Uh, it wasn't very good and the businesses weren't actually generating much value. And, there, the technology wasn't scalable. Like you needed broadband in order to get adoption, and then ultimately you needed mobile. But I think these these third generation blockchains are kind of like the broadband moment of cryptocurrency. Libra is itself just another take. It's a proof of stake kind of architecture on a blockchain, which is designed to support billions of users. And so there's going to be a bunch of competition for the billions of users blockchains. There's a ton of that that's rolling out as we speak over the course of this year and next year. And that's actually what's going to allow people to build applications, let developers build applications that are decentralized, that run around the world in a permissionless way that's, that can scale to support the internet scale usage. What I found intriguing about the Libra project is it's not, Facebook's going to have its wallet called Calibra, and I think they'll probably persuade you to use it and connect your friends, and we'll be back where we started. But the project lets others build wallets. So if you want to hold this currency, you don't have to use Facebook's product. Who is going to be building those other wallets? So crypto companies yeah, or? Absolutely. I mean, we build wallets. We build wallets that support uh, you know, 60 different digital currencies. And Libra as a currency would be attractive. We support our own stable coin, US dollar coin, which is one of the most successful stable coins out there. We support other stable coins. We're going to support whatever is demanded by users that want to have interoperable, open um, access to finance. Hmm. Uh, I've definitely got more questions, but I'd love to put it out to the audience. Uh, you know how it works by now. Please put up your hand and someone will bring you a mic. Or I'll let you sit on that for a second. Um, my next question is actually, uh, here we go. I think Adam in the front would like to ask one. Amber, could you elaborate on the comment you made about blogs? I, I, the, the conclusion I drew blogs was that- Blogs were great. Well, but, but I find it fascinating. I mean, the, the sort of the reason why no one does host their own and they, people gravitated toward Medium, I, I, I guess it just worked better that way. It was too hard otherwise. Because most people are not developers or infrastructure experts. And so you offload what you don't understand and you can't do yourself. And there's more efficiencies to have someone else do it for you. Also sounds a lot like why we have banks in a lot of ways, right? Um, but if you look at something like uh, Patreon or Kickstarter or GoFundMe, uh, those are uh, centralized financial platforms. People have talked a lot about being able to unbundle and run in a widget on the sidebar of a website. Um, all of these things fold into things that people would more call D-Web or decentralized web or whatever you want to call it. Um, but about keeping the internet itself decentralized requires a lot of content creators to be in charge of the creation and hosting uh, and management of, the, of their own infrastructure. And regular humans do not want to do that. Most people do not do their own DevOps. So unmanaged, uh, almost autonomous, let's call it smart DevOps for regular humans could make self-hosting a thing again. And that changes the power balance. But here's my question, and what, or I th what, what I heard Barry say earlier, Jeff, wasn't that uh, you know banks are necessarily going to be disrupted out of existence, but that banks will respond. And so my question to both of you is, to what extent can banks respond and be a meaningful part of this new world order, if you will, that you're describing? Yeah, well, look, I think um, banks are going to face enormous headwinds over the next decade. Think about we have a global recession, you have negative interest rates, you have banks that are, you know, kind of were built on brick and mortar infrastructure. Um, and so they have to figure out a way to ha how to reinvent themselves to cater towards a, mo a mobile first digital um, consumer base. And, and tr you know, <laughs> The fact that if you want to like wire money, send money, you know, from New York to London, if you miss the cutoff at 5 p.m. on Friday, it's not getting there until Tuesday. It's crazy. It's crazy. And so there just has to be 
Um, you know, uh, the CEOs of the banks, I think, have to approach it a little differently than some did. Um, <laughs> uh, and Ed recognized that, look, the intellectual capital that's being poured into the space is, it's the, it's the best of the best. And the capital flowing in, the innovation that's happening, and look, I, I, and I absolutely agree that from a, from a DAP perspective, from a decentralized business perspective, there ain't a whole lot there. We've invested in 145 companies so far, and I gotta tell you, tell you the ones that are getting, gaining the most traction are the ones that are building the infrastructure for the asset class, the speculative kind of use case. That's okay. There's amazing experimentation that's happening. There's really, really cool projects happening. And eventually, it is going to transform um, not just the gold market or the stock market, but banking as we know it. Yeah, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I speculate that um, a lot of the um, a, a lot of blockchain startup models are simply incompatible with venture capital funding. Um, I think that especially things that are targeted at social good. Uh, and impact function best as collective commons kinds of models and trying to push that into something where you need to demonstrate um, investor returns is it seems to be a mismatch of funding models uh, and so um, I, I don't know perhaps we'll solve that I'd love to see kind of an opening up of the uh, investment community to access what what ICOs got wrong the first time we'd love to see that be more successful um, but I guess that has nothing to do with banking being successful <laughs> we just have a few minutes left. Uh, backstage, we were talking about Washington. I'd love to go there for a bit, because on one hand, you know, we saw the House of Representatives like, you know, come down like a ton of bricks on Facebook's news. Not good. On the other hand, you guys have talked to regulators and politicians for years on this topic and sounded sort of optimistic. So campaign 2020, where's crypto going to be in it? Yeah, I mean, the, the week after I launched Circle in 2013, I testified to the Senate on cryptocurrency and the benefits and how it developed as an important infrastructure. And we've worked with regulators for six years all around the world and trying to educate them, I think, um, and you know, getting licensing and being supervised and, and you know, important pieces of the puzzle. Um, there's a lot more work to do there. I think um, the, you know, the Facebook's entry and Libra as a project is a massive inflection point in terms of a political awareness and mainstream awareness. And this will be a 2020 presidential issue insofar as Facebook is a 2020 presidential issue. And the reach of technology in society is a, is a presidential issue. And frankly, you know, immediately you saw the finance minister, central bankers from the G7 say, we need to be coordinated. We need to have a task force. We need to respond to this. You are going to see global policy coordination on cryptocurrency at a level you have not seen before. And you know, that's a double-edged sword. Right? I think on the one hand, you, you need to be able to have policy to deal with not just the currency use cases, but the securities and capital markets and, and lending and other use cases. Um, but also, um, you know, it, can, it, can open, you know, it can really open up the market, but it can also shut it down. As, as we enter the uh, election year, I think a very uh, popular theme is going to be wealth inequality um, and ways that um, uh, tax, taxes are going to change for the super wealthy. And I think it's going to bring to the forefront um, the asset class, frankly. <laughs> um, and you know, if, if, if every single candidate is talking about ways to extract value from the top 1%, um, the other 99% is going to say, yeah, let's, let's kind of go get them. And I think it's going to highlight the opportunity and the need for um, uh, around the world, not just in the US, the ability for people to have a little more control over uh, their money and where it's held and how it's kept, um, and I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna again highlight the the benefits of something like Bitcoin or Zcash. And Amber, let's wrap with you. Oh. What do you see in DC right now? Was wasn't it Beto O'Rourke who it turned out was a m member of Cult of the Dead Cow? Yeah, which is like a, a 90s hacker collective, right? Um, so uh, I think having a presidential level discussion of technology that was competent would be fantastic. And I think that it folds in in a way to people that were digital native. And I, I saw one, somebody had tweeted, you know, should we allow millennials to continue to be elected to office at such rates? And someone simply replied, I'd love to see the alternative if we don't. <laughs> so time. All right, well, on that note, uh, please give it up for uh, Barry, Amber, and Jeremy.